is lecture 28 of ECE 5312. Okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to build upon what we covered in lecture 27, which is uh, whitening filters and sort of the end-to-end -end response of uh, a, a transceiver system. And we're going to look at what do we do once we whiten the output of the received filter and it's sampled. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a bit of quick recap of lecture 27 material. And then we're going to jump into something called zero forcing equalization. We're going to touch a little bit about decision feedback equalization before, before we call it a night with respect to this, okay? So let's, let's recap what we, what we saw in lecture 20, 27. So let me change the display. Okay. So lecture 27, we saw the following. Bless you. So we had the following communication system. So we had the source plus impulse modulation, right? And it gave data in the form of IN. We then fed it through a transmit filter, H of T of T, right? And we call that V of T. We then feed that through our channel filter. And that, in turn, okay, we call it W of T. We add noise. That's Z of T. We then have a receive filter. And then after that, we, we have Y of T here. That's R of T. That gets sampled. T, ah, yay, yay, yay. T equals K big T, so there's a sampling period. And then we get Y of K, right? So let's look at this more carefully. So this guy here is white Gaussian noise, and he has a power spectral density S of N of F equals N naught, right? And if we look at this more carefully, that's my transmitter. This here is my channel, and that guy is my receiver. So, so far, so good. Right? Now, well, let, let's, let's develop this a little bit more based on like last class. We saw that we want the receive filter, in this case, to equal the complex conjugate of the time reversed version of H of t. What's H of t? H of t is sort of the combination of H t of t convolved with H C of T. Okay? So what essentially this does here, that's a match filter. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to match the receive filter to the combination of the channel and transmit filters. Okay? So far so good? Now, we go one step further. So now Y of T is equal to the summation of n goes from minus infinity to infinity i n x t n t hmm. plus z of t convolved with h r of t. And you might say, what's x? So x of t is equal to h of t convolved with h, r of t. So that's our sort of resulting convolution of these two filters cascaded with each other. Now, now that we have this, let's turn our attention to this guy here. And this guy here is kind of interesting because we're going to represent him as v of t. Um, yeah, bad notation. So you did not see another v of t anywhere. <laughs> so what happens is we'll represent the filtered noise as V of T, right? Okay, so the so the so so the question is why does H R of T equal to the complex conjugate of of H of minus T? What happens it, exactly? So it's a match filter to the combination of the channel combined with the transmit filter response. So basically, end to end, I want something SNR maximizing. But the match filter in the like previous lecture worked to the 
Transmitting signal. Ah, yes. So what ha so that's a good question. So basically, in the previous lecture, we just matched it to transmit signal. Now what happens is we have to take into account also the transmit uh, the the channel in between because it's going to manipulate the transmitted signal. So in an ideal situation, the match filter only acts upon in an AWGN environment only the transmitted signal, which has a certain pulse shape. Now that pulse shape is being manipulated by the channel, so we need to SNR maximize against the composite response of channel with transmit pulse. So that's an excellent, excellent question. So should it have T capital T? T minus T. Okay, so, um, so the question is, put a capital T? Um, not necessarily, because we don't know what the channel is. We know that the transmit filter or what pulse shape is going to be period T, right? It's going to have to, but the channel could be anything. In fact, the channel most likely what's going to do is stretch it out. So what we want to do is we say, okay, forget about the, uh, you know, the flip and then what we're going to do is when we have it at the receiver, we're going to do the sliding window and then we're going to have to figure out what, what point to sam sample it. So, so that's why we omitted the period T because uh, the, the combination the combination of the, tra uh, the transmit filter plus the channel filter will not obey necessarily fitting in a period T because of the channel. The channel could be very nasty and could smear things, M not an integer multiple of the period. Excellent question. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Good. So with this, now we're going to go into the bad news. And what's the bad news? Colored noise. Colored noise. Yes. Colored noise as opposed to white noise. Exactly. So let's, first of all, I'm going to erase my cool diagram here. But look, no chalk. <laughs> yeah. you, you, wouldn't be, um, you would be amazed what my cleaning bill is whenever I use chalk. It's unbelievable. It's like, oh my god. Like every month the pants has to go into the dry cleaners. Okay. What happens is suppose I sample this Y of T. That's the output of the receive filter. What ends up happening is we get something called YK, and that's going to be equal to N equals minus infinity infinity, IN X K minus N T, close brackets, plus VKT, or VK. And so what we need to do is like, you know, we can simplify this. What we can do is we just say VK. And we can also write this in shorthand, X, K minus N, because we know there's a period T, right? So that's cool. As long as we know the nomenclature, we're, we're cool. Now, what happens is, from this, what is this guy equal to? This guy is going to be equal to VK is equal to, from minus infinity to infinity, z of t con uh, multiplied by h conjugate minus this, dt. And you might say, what's that? That is the convolution of the noise, the filtering of the noise, if you will, with the receive filter, which has that response, right? So it's almost like I'm flipping it back, but I still have the complex conjugate, right? So this guy here now is not white noise anymore. He's filtered out. If you look at it more closely, and we did this in the last lecture, what ends up happening is that from this, we saw that E, VK, VK plus N is not going to be equal to delta N. That's bad. Not white. Okay. So as a result, in fact, if you compute this, this guy is actually equal to n naught x uh, that guy is equal to n naught xk. Turns out it's xk. So what happens is you might say, what's xk? That's the convolution of h of t with h r of t. Right, that's the sort of composite response end to end. So that multiplied by n naught gives us the shape. Uh, well, in this case, this is our autocorrelation function, right? That's 
um, RV of, in this case, K. Now, what's worse is what's the power spectral density of it? This is where we figure out something's white or not. So already we have something here that X of K, unless it's a delta at zero, this will not be white. Spectrally, what does this look like? SV of Z is equal to N naught X of Z. Totally not white unless X of Z is flat, right? So, as I mentioned in class, as you saw in your problem sets, what you can do is use something called a whitening filter. Every time I think about that, I think of toothpaste. I don't know why, but, you know. Now, <laughs> what happens is you have V of K. It goes into this whitening filter, and you might say, okay, here's 1 over F, 1 over Z star, right? And then output is N of K. And he is white, right? So what does white mean again? So in the old days, like, I'm, uh, like you know, like, you know, what, does, what, what frequencies does white light contain? All of them, of equal strength, right? So spectrally, when you have white noise or white anything, spectrally, the power spectral density should be all frequencies, all the same magnitude. When things are colored, when you have a certain color or something, it means some frequencies are coming through more than others, right? You're filtering out the rest, right? Ah, good. Now, how do we get this? Well, for instance, it turns out that if we design... F to be equal to um, itself multiplied by the complex conjugate of itself, uh, you know, 1 over Z conjugate. So if we can design this, right, if we can come up with something like this, and we know what X of Z is equal to, we can accomplish getting a whitening filter. So this guy here, This guy here, we call a whitening filter. Okay? And so what we saw in the last class, so everything I'm writing down here right now is all recapping from lecture 27, okay? So if we look at this, S of N of Z is going to be equal to this guy. Right? Because what is that guy? It's how you get the mag... So in the continuous frequency domain, it's the magnitude squared of the transfer function, and we saw that. In the Z domain, it's a little bit more messier. You have whatever the function is, the transfer function, multiplied by its complex conjugate, and the internal argument instead of Z is 1 over Z complex conjugate. That's the equivalent of getting the magnitude squared. So we do that, we get this guy, and here's the input PSD, and we know that this guy here is equal to n naught x of z. Oh, we know what that's equal to. That's f of z and f conjugate 1 over z conjugate. So the numerator, denominator cancel out, and lo and behold, you get n naught, and that's our white process. Right? So this is sort of recapping because now we're going to jump into designing equalizers that capitalize on the fact that we have white noise, right? So let's, let's go over to the slide. So enough of blah, blah on the wh whiteboard for now. So what we have is a zero-forcing equalizer. So what, 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 what's con what are its characteristics? So first of all, um, potentially infinite number, yes. Yeah. Okay, so the question... So the question is, when, when we, we would use the whitening filter? And the answer is, um, you know, most of the techniques that we come up with, all the expressions for probability of an error and everything, all rely on the fact that we have an AWGN channel. Once we no longer have white noise, all that goes out the window, and the mathematics becomes very, if not intractable, become very, very difficult. So if you try and do some sort of quantitative analysis of, of let's say, after it passes through like some sort of pulse, like you know, several filters and stuff, and in the end your your noise is mangled, 
you can't do much math without it unless you bring it back to a whitened state. But then what happens is when you whiten it, oh, now I have to equalize it. And, you know, and that, that's the thing. Now we can do the necessary signal processing post-whitening that, oh, thank goodness, we have white noise. So when we do, then do the equalization and everything like we're, gonna, we're going to, we have the math that in the end, what's the probability of error? Oh, it's PE is equal to Q function 1 over sigma or something like that, as opposed to, I don't know, I'm not sure how to deal with white noise. And I th I'm trying to think which team, which team? I think it's uh, Anne and uh, um, uh, Nikita. Uh, you guys are dealing with a non-white no, um, interference in noise, but essentially it's not spectrally flat, and it's a little tricky, right? Like what you guys are doing. So, yeah, yeah, that, and that's their course design project. So, <laughs> so yeah, so there, that's that's why. Like if we can whiten it, we we can recycle a lot of the math. The same thing later on when we do lectures 29 and 30. Like, what's so special about multi-carrier? Well, what happens is when you look at the channel, it might be frequency selective. But when you're looking at it from this tiny little slice, oh, it looks approximately flat. And then you can employ those techniques, like basically for the AWGN case, which are tried and true, right? So great question. Yep. Hey. OK. So zero forcing equalizers. So basically, we're going to start off like in, in this implementation. Like so, so here's the whitening filter, right? And so now the output of that, what we're interested in is can we design a C of Z? And my apologies, the notation's all over the place. C of Z, isn't that the channel impulse results? No, no, no. In this case, <laughs> next time I'm going to just come up with my own alphabet. But what happens is C of Z in this case is our equalizer. So with C of Z, if we design it correctly, what C of Z is going to do is it will yield the desired information sample without any ISI con contributions and a noise term. And what will be once, we, and then the quantizer, what's so beautiful about the quantizer? So let's say this is just plus one, minus one, right? Assume plus one, minus one. If we get rid of the ISI, so I'm going to go back to this thing. No. Let me try it again. So let's go back to this guy. So how would an equalizer work on plus 1 and minus 1? Well, easy, right? What happens is if my, if my signal is above 0, like anywhere here, I classify it as a plus 1. And if it's b below here, I quantize it as a minus 1, right? And then, so let's say, theoretically, I transmitted this and then the noise moves it all around, right? And so we saw what happens when the noise does that, right? Especially if it's Gaussian noise. It does that. You have a little bit of a tail that potentially could push your symbol below, um, let me use an, another color, the threshold tau. And we saw that the noise, if you transmit as minus 1, again, the noise does that too, right? So what happens is these tail probabilities that noise pushes it down. And we saw what happens if, let's say, it's plus 1 or minus 1, right? It turns out that the probability of error very quickly, ah, no, 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 no. Turns out that the probability of error in that case would be, some, as I'm going to show, is about something like that, right? Transmit power is 1 because we essentially transmit 1 or minus 1, right? And the only thing that will really matter is that sigma. And we want to integrate from that, like, you know, the tail probabilities. And so if we do this calculation, that's what we get. And that's what we're going to see. But it's imperative. This thing here assumes white noise, right? Now, you might ask, OK, so what happens if there's ISI? Remember what happens when there was ISI? We had the following um, curve. We did this several lectures ago. Remember what we got. Here's, let's say, my probability of error curve, right? <whistles> Waterfall. You know what? I'm trying to think of a name for my house. You know, something cool like, you know, like, like Downton Abbey or 
blah, 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 Wiglinski's Manor or something. But, you know, something nice. Like, you know, usually it's like, you know, something that is like you, you can think of and reminisce and say, that's such a cool name. Maybe I should call, call my house like Waterfall after the waterfall curve. Oh, yes. And then put a little plaque at the entrance with the waterfall curves. My neighbors would love me. No, no. My na- the only thing my neighbors uh, love about me is the fact that, um, well, no, I'm, I'm, that and also I'm a good neighbor, but, no, but in the sense that I keep to, to my own property and stuff, they love my dog. They're like, oh, you're the guy with me like a dog. Oh, we love him. You know, yeah, trust me. So, yeah, but uh, great neighbors. But what happens is, remember what happens when we have um, both noise and distortion from ISI. Remember what happened? So what happens is ISI can either work in our favor and push us further away from that threshold. Remember, in fact, if we had, like, let's say, um, precursor and postcursor ISI, we can be quite a distance away. Because what happens is if we refer to that diagram, right? So let's say that's my plus one threshold. And that's my minus one threshold. And with the, let's say if we had precursor or postcursor ISI, or both, and it moves us even further away, we need even more noise to push us over this threshold tau. On the other hand, if the ISI works in the other direction, we move up the waterfall curve for the same noise power and same transmit power, right? So that's a bad scenario. So what I would like to do, going back to the first slide here, is I would like to design a visualizer that takes the ISI terms out of the game. So how do I do that? First thing is I whiten. But we need a signal model. We need a signal model. And that guy is it, WK. So that's the output of the whitening filter. It is essentially from minus infinity to infinity, the sum of all the information bits multiplied by, in this case, it's sort of the flipped version of the impulse response, f of n. And you might say, OK, where did, where did f come from? I only see 1 over f um, complex conjugate, 1 over z complex conjugate. Well, what happens is, let's say we take uh, the sampled version of what's happening of y, y of t, right? And we know what that guy is. What is the information? What is the information bits here? It's i right, the information, times x of n or t or whatever. But in the frequency domain, it's x of z, right? What's x of z? It's f of z and f conjugate square uh, brackets 1 over z conjugate. So numerator and denominator to cancel out, all you're left with is the information bit f of z, which in the time domain is the convolution of the information bits with f of n. Right? So let, let, me, let me, you know that I want to play with the whiteboard. So what the heck am I talking about? Sometimes I wonder too. In fact, before this lecture, I was like saying, how do I communicate this with them? I don't, I don't even know. This is confusing as heck. Here's what I mean. So after the sampling, right? So what do we have? So we have y of k's. What's y of k equal to? It's equal to n equals minus infinity to infinity. Let me just make sure I have this written. I of n, x, x, k minus n. Yes. Plus v of k. Now, pass it through 1 over f star, 1 over z star. What do we know about this guy in the frequency domain? So x of z is equal to f of z, f star, 1 over z star, right? Now, the output here, which is w of k, is going to be equal to, well, what happens is in the frequency domain, we, when, you know, everything's multiplicative, right? So in the time domain, so in the frequency domain, you can see that this guy and this guy are going, ah, this guy here are going to cancel each other out. All that's going to be left is this f of z thing. And then there's this time reversal because we're doing convolution in the discrete time case. So what we're left with is this. I of n. And then we have f 
k minus n, and lo and behold, we have white noise. Um, just want to make sure, yeah, this guy, right? So that's what we have. Now, this guy, this model, I'm going to emphasize is extremely important for the next several slides, okay? Put a star. Now, this is we move on to the next. Yeah, it took, what, 20 minutes to do one slide. No, just kidding. What happens is our goal, our goal, folks, is that, that in this thing here, this thing here essentially is a delta. Or it's just a sequence of deltas. We have no ISI whatsoever to accomplish that. What happens? And in fact, there's a probability of error expression I was telling you about. So if white noise, and if we can eliminate ISI, our probability of error becomes pretty straightforward, right? All we have to worry about is the noise power. If we have a plus or minus one, it becomes a thresholding issue, right? So. As a result, we need to com come up with some sort of C of F, C of Z, some sort of equalizer that achieves zero ISI. So no more dual binary, no more partial, uh, partial response signaling, none of that stuff. I want Zippo, no ISI whatsoever. Okay? Now, it's kind of interesting, but you might notice that there are different requirements. So what, what does that mean? Like, you know, how do we... How do we get the best possible equalizer? What's our metric? You know, that's what I love about, like, engineers in general. But, like, you know, what would you consider a success? Yes? So with equalizer, we don't need to use the rate cosine anymore for pulse shifting? OK, so the question is, do we still use pulse shaping? And the answer is um, no. Well, well, depends. So what you could do, what you can do is you have you know, well, you can do one of several things. So the formulation that we have here, no, no race cosine. Theor so if because the way we formulated it is transmit filter and channel filter are kind of one response, and we're trying to match to it. Another way is what we did in today's quiz, which is end to end. I want this desired Nyquist pulse shape, and I want everything to nicely match up to that. So this is sort of a different tact. Suppose I have a channel response and a transmit filter. I can sound out the impulse response of the two by sending an impulse. And so the receivers match to that. Then I do the sampling. I then do the whitening. And now after all of that stuff, OK, now this is the best possible condition of all of these things. Not, we're not assuming any sort of raised cosine or anything like that. Let's see if we can eliminate ISI altogether with one single filter. OK, so good. That's a great question. We're not assuming any sort of raised cosine pulses whatsoever. Good question. Good question. But what happens is this opens up a Pandora's box otherwise, because what is that metric? So we saw zero ISI is very simple. Zero ISI. Here, we may achieve that. If we don't, what's the metric for saying we're as close as we can possibly be? And the answer is, well, one thing is you can say, oh, probability of error. Yeah, you can say that. What most people do with equalizers, it's a minimum mean squared error. Right? MMSE. So what happens is you have the original, let's say, impulse or information bit, and you have the reconstructed after equalization. Are they a dead-on match? Are they like twins? Or are they close enough? How close? You know? And that's the beautiful thing. When you look at equalizers, it's like, OK, uh, under these conditions, what's my MMSE? for this design, and this design, and this design. Changing, let's say, coefficients, and you know, tar, uh, you know, trying to achieve almost, if you can get zero MMS, uh, zero mean squared error, that's fantastic. But if you don't, hmm, small is better, OK? So in order to do that, what we do in this case is to make the zero forcing equalizer, we took that beautiful response that I put a star around, and we take its Z transform, right? Why deal with convolution when you can play with Z transforms? Ah, OK. So what happens is we have the information signal Z transform. We have the filter F of Z, and we know where that comes from. And we have the noise, and it also has a Z transform. 
And so when we, and at the same time, what we want is when we take that W of Z that's out of the output of the whitening filter and multiply it with the frequency response, the transfer function of this equalizer C of Z, it should give us the output of the ZFE, the zero forcing equalizer, and hopefully, 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 we have no ISI. And so that's what we have over And then here's our equalizer. We desire this to be equal to Q of Z. As for a noise, what you're going to do, right? We can only unwhiten and whiten so many times, right? But that's fine. That's cool. So what we ultimately want is if we take the inverse Z transform of this, so this now becomes uh, Q of N or Q of K, sorry. So this will be I of K convolved with Q of K. That's going to be the discrete time convolution plus NK prime. So it's the white noise that has been passed through the equalizer. We'll see if that's white or not. All right? If it's not, then we'll need to come up with what its variance is. Okay? Now, the desired response. So when do we know this thing works? And I think I mentioned this a few times, especially in like the quiz and stuff. So what's the ideal end-to-end -end response if the, like normally like, you can say, oh, like, you know, I think like, uh, I forgot who asked me. Um, the end-to-end -end response, uh, what should it be? Should it be raised cosine? In part C, yes. But I could say anything. I can say end-to-end -end response, how about it's a delta, you know? And what would that mean? That's the ideal case. No distortion. Maybe it's time delayed. That's fine. So I have a synchronizing algorithm. Here, the only term I have is the desired term and no previous or future terms. I just want that term only and nothing else. So the inverse Z transform of F of Z times C of Z gives me a delta. Oh, then it's victory. Victory! No. What happens is that's what I want. No ISI. How do you get that? Easy! <laughs> Theoretically. What happens is the easy thing to do is, what is a delta? We need to take the Z transform. Pew! Constant. It's a 1. So, Q of Z is equal to 1, which is equal to FZ CZ, right? Oh, wow! Okay, so what should CZ be equal to? 1 over F of Z. Yeah, no problem. Let's take the inverse Z transform of that. There we go. We have your zero forcing equalizer. What's wrong with that? If you try and implement that using FIR filters, it can go on for infinity. Right? Think about it. Okay, totally. I'm just going to totally draw that because I can animate with my hands or I can show you my artistic ability, which is like, you know, let me, let me show you the best way I can draw a human being, okay? As a side note. You know, that's why I sucked in art, you know? Because that's a person. That, that, I think that's my sister, yes, you know? Oh, sorry. I also am told that I do really poor impersonations. So whenever I impersonate my little sister, she talks like this. But seriously, she's about my height. She really has a deep voice. Anyways, okay, Joanne. Um, my parents, when, when this goes online, my parents see this or she sees that I'm so dead. But anyways, they, she won't make it till lecture 28. But, um, so what happens? So Q of K, the desire is to have it equal to a delta, which means that it's equal to 1 when K is equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. By doing that, we have no ISI. Because when we convolve I of K convolved with Q of K, this will give me what? This will give me desired samples I of K. And then there will be that pesky noise. Now, Z transform of Q of K 
gives me Q of Z. But what's the Z transform of delta K? It's going to be equal to a 1. It's going to be equal to a constant. Now, we know that Q of Z is equal to F of Z, C of Z. Now, we know that that's equal to 1. So, what is C of Z? C of Z is equal to 1 over F of Z. So, if F of Z is a finite impulse response filter, 1 over, sorry, F of Z. If F of Z is FIR, There's a, unfortunately a bad situation here. One FIR, FIR, infinite impulse response. It will never stop. That's why at the beginning, the characteristic of the zero forcing equalizer is that it could continue on for infinity. If we truncate, we will no longer have no ISI, right? And that's what I was talking about. Like, you know, for, so for instance, if you talk about like the MMSE, one way of minim you know, minimizing is what happens if I have 500 taps of my FIR filter approximating the IR filter? What happens if I have 1,000 taps, 5,000 taps, the MMSE? And then you look at the trade-off analysis. For double number of taps, my mean squared error only goes down like 1%. Is it really worth it now, including the delay? and all that resources on the FPGA or whatever sort of hardware you're implementing on? And the answer is no, 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 not worth it, right? So this, this is, folks, what I'm, 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 I'm screaming about, is essentially, if you do all of this, that guy is your zero-forcing equalizer, which is nice in some ways, but not nice in others because it's IIR, right? Now, what we want to do is, I mentioned this trick. It's like, suppose my variable, let's say the only variable I have is if I can approximate C of Z equals to 1 over F of Z, I approximate it, I truncate 1 over F of Z by a certain time. I said, okay, 500 taps, that's all you got. That, wouldn't that be cool? Next, next class quiz. Design me a filter, at most 500 taps, no more, you know. <laughs> oh, so anyways... I'm not going to repeat that question onto the recording. So, no, I'm not sure. But the thing is, I think this would, be, this would actually be a cool exercise to try out at home. Because what happens is, is like, maybe, maybe finding the 500 taps is not. But what is useful is, what's our metric? The MSC, right? So what happens is, this might be on the next quiz. What happens is, find the mean squared error. Forget minimum. Minimum means you have to do you know, minimization, first order derivative, second order derivative, blah, 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 blah. So what you want to do is you know that the output is going to be I of K, which has no noise, and some NK prime term, which is shaped noise, right? It, it goes through the equalizer just like the signal did. So the goal is the mean squared error is the difference between um, the noisy version of the reconstructed signal and the original signal. And when you go through all of this, what you find up getting is the mean squared error is actually equal to the shape noise variance. Ah, oh, interesting. This is assuming, though, that I have an infinite number of taps. So maybe they have it at your workplace. So, you know, FPGA can fit in an infinite number of taps, right? Right? No, no just kidding. Even if you were privy to that knowledge, if, uh, you would not be allowed to talk. No, no just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Thinking too much of like... Uh, you know, um, red, hunt for red October stuff. Anyways, so what happens is, how would this guy look like? Well, the power spectral density of the noise will actually, just like before, so what is our filter, what is our frequency response? Well, it's C of Z, right? And we know that the magnitude squared in the, you know, the continuous frequency domain is equal to, in, in the discrete, in the uh, Z transform, is C of Z times C conjugate 1 over Z conjugate times the power spectral density of the noise going in, and not. And then what happens is, if we, if we do all this math, what we find out that, in fact, the noise at the output has a power spectral density that is equal to n naught over, oh, our good friend x of z. It's funny. Remember what happened before? 
we had the noise going into the whitening filter being n naught x of z. Now, out of the equalizer, it's n naught over x of z. Hmm? Can't get rid of the x of z. This is if we make it finite? No, no, no. This, uh, so, so this is assuming that this is infinite. We have infinite resources. We have some god mode FPGA out there somewhere that we can implement this. Now, what happens is the zero forcing equalizer, how do we find this guy? How do we, so what do we do? What happens is I want to find the inverse Z transform of that power spectral density because that guy, when we set the frequency to zero, the DC term will, well, actually, no, 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 I take it back. We don't set the frequency term. Basically, if we can find the inverse Z transform of S of N prime of Z, this will give us the variance. This will give, but bad news, folks. Contour integral. Oh, contour integral. So that funny integral, C, with the circle, contour integral. So we're going to have to do residue calculus. Ah, oh, you know, not on a Wednesday. OK. <laughs> Mondays, maybe, but OK. So what happens, in order to find the autocorrelation of the noise, we're going to have to take the contour integral of the power spectral density of the noise at the output of the equalizer. It's equal to this mess. And then what happens is we want to find out, uh, in particular, not so much the entire general expression, but for k equals 0. We want to find out what the DC term is. So if you plug that in and you do the expression, so what happens is if you work this out, so again, so what happens is you actually do this, like, little trick. So maybe there's a little more math to here than I want to talk about. So what happens is, let's say we let k equal 0. We plug everything in, and we turn out like, oh, what is s of n of z equal to? It's n naught over x of z. So we plug that in, and then we also have a z term, right? And then what happens is, we know what x of t is equal to from the previous lecture. So as a result, when we expand everything out, this guy here, we do a change of variables. We let z equal to e to the j omega big T. The derivative of z is equal to e j dw, d omega, sorry, which simplifies, again, we can re rewrite things in Uh, be, before we basically had the entire circle, we, we, we do a change of variables across everything, and it turns out that this guy is our expression, and if you notice, this is no longer a contour integral. Hey, okay, so no residues. Ah, good, no residues. So what happens is we go from no residue, we solve this pesky little integral expression, and one more step we use Parseval's theorem. So remember Parseval's theorem between energy in the time domain and energy in the frequency domain? There is like this, this, this interesting relationship between the two. We use that. So what happens is we have frequency representation in Parseval's theorem as we see here. Energy in the time domain. By this expression, it gives us the energy in the frequency domain. We plug that in. Okay, and we do a change of variables, and so what we get at the end, like, you know, the x, uh, x of k is equal to this expression here with this h equivalent omega tilde, which is equal to this expression here, right? So there's a lot of, like, these little, little tricks and stuff, but the bottom line is the following. So we have x of k is equal to this expression. We know that that's equal to x is k. The MSC is equal to this, where h equivalent is equal to this expression over here. And so what we have at the end of the day, okay, so we have some function of this h of w. So we take this h of w expression and we manipulate it. So it's a function of that guy. And that is our mean squared error. And if we want to minimize it, then we go through, you know, the first and second order derivatives and stuff. And that, folks, is how we, like, you know, just putting this back here. So there's a lot of this, like, nitty-gritty nitty math.
But what we can, but essentially what we want to do is, from the Z transform, we need to get it back into the time domain. In order to do it, we use a contour integral on the Z transform. It turns out, OK, this thing's annoying. We're going to have to do residue calculus. Before we do that, we do a change of variables to bring it into sort of like a continuous frequency domain type of deal, which we do know how to handle. And it's no longer a contour integral. It's a regular integral. We manipulate the entire expression, and it will give us this guy here. And that's where, you know, there you do your mathematics. And pretty much without going to any more gory details, that's how you would solve for the zero forcing equalizer. But conceptually, what the zero forcing equalizer does is this. Essentially, you have your equalizer, and it is equal to 1 over f of z. And f of z is one of the components that form your whitening filter, right? Now, to solve for it, you know, if you, if you have the luxury of doing so, you can use infinite number of taps. If you're not so fortunate, you have to truncate. And if you want a performance evaluation of how well, like, you know, what's your MSC, you just have to play with contour integrals and then get it out of that mode. All right? So what we're going to do now is there is another beast that all of you should be aware of. So there's ZFE, and that's impractical because you're going to have to truncate. The alternative is something called the DFE, or Decision Feedback Equalizer. And what the Decision Feedback Equalizer does is it, it, it uses a combination of causal and anti-causal filters. There's a feedback mechanism and a feed-forward mechanism that's treating everything as you move along. So just like before, remember, so you have your analog match, match filter, that R, um, HR of T. And then you sample, 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 sample. So what happens is you have a forward equalizer that's treating your information. And then you feed it into a summation, which we'll come back to in a minute. And then so you have some sort of um, quantity that you want to quantize. You want to make a decision on. And then so some people might not have seen this, the double hat, right? So IK hat is my estimated. Like, you know, this is my symbol. This, I think, is what IK is. And then the quantizer is like, this is my decision. Right? Now, what happens is the output of your quantizer is fed back into determining or correcting for what is that symbol. So you have two sets of filters. You have BZ and you have AZ working on your data, both feeding forward and feeding back in order to get you some, uh, some, some sort of like estimate of what your data is. So you have a causal filter. That's what B of Z is equal to. And then A of Z is anti-causal. So there's a, there's a, there's a forward look, there's a forward looking and a rever uh, looking back portion to this design. And it gets kind of messy. We are not going to talk about too much in this class. This is, I just want to sort of like FYI, like there is something called DFE. Proactive go into gory details these are about. All right? Like in Proacus, in fact, uh, this equation, 9.5-7, he uh, actually puts conditions on perfect decision feedback in his book. So, and again, like the, the thing about his book is he goes into the gory details, like down to every last Greek letter. Okay? So, one thing I want to note before we conclude this lecture is the fact that um, information that's coded, equalization won't work too well because the thing is um, the DFEs are really to deal with like bursty error phenomena. Uh, uh, um, no, it won't work too well because the DFE experiences bursty error phenomena which are not um, acceptable for decoding. So uh, that's so the decoder, the decoder deals with sort of like Random events, like, like here's a bunch of distortion that happens at this moment. That's where your coding techniques come in. Um, equalization, as you saw, ISI phenomenon, the channel, unless it's radically time varying, equal, the equalizer is designed for something a little bit more predictable. 
right? Then you have adaptive equalizers where if your channel is varying over time, over a certain period of time or uh, duration, what happens is your equalizer keeps track of that, all right? Okay, so with that, uh, that concludes um, lecture, lecture 28. Okay, yay. So that, okay, so no more equalizer talk, no more.